Hello everyone, today we talk about Frederick Barbarossa, the Lombard League, and the Peace of Constance, thus um, essentially the most uh, important uh, phase of Holy Roman Imperial history, given that Germany in the second half of the 12th century was essentially the most powerful country in Europe, um, and um, had the concrete chance to essentially accomplish what was the uh, universal empire as far as the unification of the Mediterranean and Europe was concerned, right? And this struggle um, is one of the most important fact in um, in Western history because, of course, of the uh, context uh, that is also dating back in time. Uh, that is usually misunderstood, right? From one side, you have basically in in pop culture uh, an Italian communal history that practically does not exist, a very sketchy and kind of stereotypical idea of what the Holy Roman Empire really was, also what the, the nature of the Germanic monarchy really was, and also a, a dramatic lack of interest in the investor struggles that. Again, to, to the average person, you talk just about priests fundamentally. They don't even understand what it is, but it's boring, right? And you don't want to listen to that. Um, there is so much about this that, of course, we can't sum up uh, concretely just in one video. Um, today, I decided to stick to the general picture of uh, essentially what started happening from the fourth Italian expedition of Frederick Barbarossa to... In fact, the the defeat at Legnano, the peace of Constance, and the recognition of the uh, Italian communal, actually the the Lombard League um, communal um, prerogatives, autonomies, because the 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 peace actually certainly had to do just with. In fact, those who had foes uh, in the Pope Valley, right? And Central Italy was another thing. And for that, we should also understand what kind of, in fact, policy was the Hohenstaufen pursuing. As far as also the compaction of Germany was concerned, because many um, uh, Central Italian feudal uh, districts had been assigned to the Belfin, as a matter of fact, and you know that much of the balance, also the the, the Germanic Lombard Wars at this point, even though it's it's wrong to, to call it like this, just we can't use it as a setting because there were Lombards from both sides, but let's say that especially at, at home in Germany, uh, Henry the Lion, uh, that we also have never quite seen in, in detail in a single video, um, and not even... In, that the broader struggle with his cousin, Frederick, uh, was uh, essentially pursuing a different policy that was of, of course, political hegemony, especially in the north of Germany, um, also in Bavaria, as far as this basically Saxon-Bavarian axis was opposed to the Franconian-Swabian one. Um, and, um, let's say, being literally begged uh, from from Frederick that kneeled in front of him. This this was he did so um, as a relative, but he was the Holy Roman Emperor, right? To to send reinforcements in Italy, um, which missing right from Saxony, just in eleven seventy six, brought to dis disaster, um, from which uh, the same Barbarossa barely escaped alive, and or. You know, he risked to be captured uh, concretely. It, it's debatable whether it was just a matter of the Saxon reinforcements or not, but there is a wall imperial policy here that must be taken in consideration as far as also the German side of the story uh, was concerned. Uh, today we will talk mostly about Italy, but as it will be evident from the, the timeline, you realize that Frederick couldn't campaign there um, on, um, he, I mean, he did surely so by by massive scale, but uh, still at some different years of distance, right, between the various expeditions. 
Um, and uh, the only possibility of carrying them out, evidently at that point, was settling matters in, in Germany, in Central Europe. And that that's a part that we will not see today, but it's of course important, because uh, you, you must understand from which background he was coming from, and what he could also politically and strategically hope to accomplish. And the matter, naturally, even when talking about the military side of the story, is political in nature, right? And a lot could be said about this chapter of European history, because it it confronts so much that is the dream of the Renovatio Imperi on the base of a Roman and Germanic base, and this is absolutely evident in the person of Frederick that also promoted in Bologna, as you know, the revival of Roman law uh, necessary to enforce his prerogatives uh, on the papacy that was from the other side, together with, uh, in fact, a uh, nascent uh, Italian civilization that stemmed essentially from a, uh, a, a an exceptionally unique communal profile that, as we've seen in Europe, basically doesn't know comparisons, that was basically taking over the old feudal hierarchy. It was essentially the same one as we will see now that had been invested by Frederick of consistent power to hopefully, say, rebuild that, in fact, uh, imperial order that traditionally hand passed through, through the field of, from from the vassals um, and not from polities that have fundamentally uh, and would fundamentally win their own uh, their own imperium uh, in council on the battlefield against the same imperial force right so there is so much there because you see in part um, it's surely wrong as I was saying before to frame this as a German versus Italian struggle. It's a common mistake, a lot of people do. But um, there is also a lot about what had happened in the previous generations, namely the investiture controversy and what this had brought in Germany that had been fundamentally already the, the collapse of a significant part of the uh, public institutions. Right After Worms, uh, the papacy had basically won by, you know, also imperial agreement, the investiture of the Italian bishops. Uh, there was some ambiguity on Burgundy, but fundamentally the emperor just retaining the German ones, and you know that at this point, that is, again, the peak of German monarchic power, historically. You see that the emperor, of course, couldn't control um, most of Germany, right? The, the Hohenstaufen were advantaged by the position that was just basically uh, on, on the other side of the Alps and still connected with the Frankish grandeur uh, as it had consolidated on the Rhine and Main and on the great um, imperial cities. There is, as we'll see now, a lot of also Carolingian ideology um, that was resumed in an anti-Lombard uh, fashion. And you would think that even this kind of cultural aspects were important propagandistically at, at the time. It was naturally a resistance from the German vassals, most of which were not interested in campaigning. Um, in Italy, there is all, um, you know, a, a military side of the story that we have observed as far as the ministerialists are, are concerned. Most of the, the German armies of the Holmfacht here were made up by um, ecclesiastical ministerialists and mostly coming from, in fact, more or less the same areas that, 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 the, that the Swabians controlled. Uh, and uh, at this time, of course, the great German uh, ecclesiastical principalities were still siding with, with the emperor. And so you have actually a, a major and brutal effort to subjugate um, the Italian communes, um, culminating even with the destruction of Milan that was promptly um, rebuilt from scratch. And, you know, I, I don't know if you have the idea of what, what this means for, for, for those time standards. Even in seeing the um, enormous amount of moral material resources that eventually were displayed also, as we were saying before, in open field, in a time in which the imperial cavalry was really, you know, the, the, the toughest in Europe, right, and with Lombard infantrymen capable of literally withstanding them for, for 
for an entire day, an entire day of fighting, right? So, with a with a determination and obviously um, uh, a political will that is the one that eventually led them to uh, to victory, to the recognition of their prerogatives within the empire. Because again, this may seem um, again anachronistic, but literally, the concept is that by equating as it would be down in Constance, the Feudatories with, with Italian communes, albeit, and, and, you know, the latter being properly recognized as something on their own, right? So not something that was um, just invested by feudal delegation, but essentially pre-existed, and the same um, imperial officials would have had to um, abide the, um, the, their, in fact, their, their statutes, right? They're, they're essentially their communal constitutions uh, means that these people, the, the, the Lombard consuls had the imperium themselves and, and this was clamorous as far as of course the, the major effort of uh, the empire was crippled here, right? The, the major turning point, I made a couple of videos about that, would be just the uh, incredibly successful uh, Swabian succession in Sicily at the extinction of the Hauteville which changed the game again, and that that's what brought uh, Frederick's grandson, his name's sake, um, to to actually fight again with the Lombard League and um, losing again. But when you look at what the the mere Battle of Legnano shifted in terms of international uh, relations and ratios of strength, right? As far as you know the. The Crusader states um, that were banal involved, just you know, uh, Conrad of Montferrat uh, at a point was one of the uh, just ruler in the Holy Land. But um, you know, the arguably the most political, the most important political and strategic pawn of Barbarossa historically in, in in Italy, the entire balance there was occurring with the Byzantine Empire. Manuel Comnenus was interfering heavily. Uh, in Italy, Nicetas Coniatis even goes as far as saying that you know the, the epidemic that broke out in um, Frederick's army in, in um, 1166, uh, what, uh, 67 was um, caused by Byzantine agents that sabotaged the, the German supplies. Um, but the same relation with the, with the Normans in or Hungary, and so. Um, um, a dramatic ship that contracted basically at that point any possibility before uh, the the Norman marriage of of uh, of the Hohenstaufen to enact their imperial uh, dreams, which were absolutely uh, coherent. Right in the 19th century, the German nationalistic historiography began to say bullshit like, ah, no, the Germans should have invested, I don't know, in the north and in the east, because it's the true vocation, that's, you know, Henry the Lion is the true spirit uh, of the north, and instead the, the Swabians were just uh, daydreamers that were running after the Mediterranean chimera. Um, you know, the Velfen, as soon as they, <laughs> they became um, emperors, they did the same exact thing that the Swabians were doing, because it was the only possible thing that any Roman emperor could do in the first place because it's a Roman imp, right? Properly, the entire concept here of anything, in fact, um, uh, actually centrifugally escaping as not quite the Lombard case is, but it, it's something that had to be at least reaffirmed after, uh, at least theoretically after, at the Peace of Constance, by the way, um, is uh, the 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 struggle again that not just these um, peoples put up for, for their autonomy uh, for their liberty but also for uh, the what the empire had to be about right I mean the, the the Germanic Emperor was supposed to literally achieve universal rule just because he was the Roman so the only possible Emperor right and the obvious objective of all the Holy Roman Emperors was to rule from, essentially from Italy, right? That was their only um, main objective, right? That there was nothing by scale that could compare with that. This is what Frederick II would try with all the uh, what the Ottonians had actually accomplished by a degree, at least, you know, with in a much different time, 
in which, of course, the, the direct control of both Italy and Germany was, was not feasible, just per se. Uh, but there were other ways. And so what happens in the 12th century is, um, of course, uh, representative of a great part of what the Western um, culture was undergoing, um, especially in terms of, of political and institutional development. And we will see, hopefully, this better also in the time of Frederick II. And um, analyzing the, the specificities of, of these rules, because, um, as we were saying before, I know the, the hatred that objectively in Germany existed towards the papacy after Worms, and the, uh, in fact, the, the continuous political instability that was ended only with, with the rise of Frederick because he descended both from the from he was both a Hohenstaufen but also descended from uh, the Welfen uh, through his mother right that could recompact right so there was a massive amount of of royal power lost um, in the defeat against the papacy um, and this the 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 brutal determination also with which Barbarossa, that, as you know, was one of the, the greatest commanders of the time, pursued the objective of the, in, uh, subjugating the, uh, the, the Lombard communes is um, it, you, you can't help but seeing it fueled also by that cultural divide, right? I will skip here any consideration also about will perhaps address it part of the fact that um, when the Germans descended in Italy again in the second half of the 12th century, they couldn't believe their eyes, right? Uh, and because what the communes had uh, affirmed politically, military, and socially was something that was completely unknown north of the Alps. Um, the idea of, again, uh, free men, something that you would actually in Germany hadn't existed from quite a while by that point. Um, having plus than, than liberty, but properly the fact that the right of bearing arms and having associated in what were to evolve essentially in city-states and managing to impose their will even on the feudal hierarchy of the Italic kingdom, uh, the, the sheer level of literacy, the, the level of wealth both in absolute and in uh, distribution terms, um, the of course the administrative development the fact that of course that the emperor used the, the Bolognese jurists to affirm his Roman prerogatives um, and more because here the objective was not just let's say uh, the Italic kingdom was as you know necessary to receive uh, the Holy Roman Imperial crown which Barbarossa at this point was discussed in the video had already obtained since the his first expedition in 1154 but also um, the, the presence of the Normans in the south, uh, of course of the Byzantines, of that broader picture that is, is often missed, as, I presume, as much as properly the, the history of the Lombard Leagues proper, uh, are in fact the only possible key to read um, this, this, this story. And of course there was a lot of opposition in Germany, as we were saying before, there are some satirical works that depict uh, Frederick uh, like the lion that uh, tries to essentially tap all uh, those um, ants nests that would basically represent the various uh, Italian communes and that eventually you know is overwhelmed and breaks down right and representing this not, not much just the symbol of the empire per se which was regarded still as highly but the in fact, the Leonine temper of the emperor, in fact, was pretty uh, fiery and, um, you know, kind of energetic and, and uh, raging, actually. We, we are told about this from his personality, aggressive, um, you know, courageous, brave, um, determined, so on. Uh, being destroyed as... A, so, uh, the lion is the prototype of, of the human strength, or of the warrior proper, right? So it's different from the, the eagle and the, the imperial uh, ideology, but the, here crushed by uh, essentially the tonic popular elements that, however, are too much for even at least what had to be an emperor, so the, the sole ruler uh, of the world to, to be able to tame. 
Um, and this this is powerful stuff because they these people the, the 12th century is an incredibly and primitively brutal and archaic time, right? You know, it's this is not yet even for the Italian communes that moment of say massive humanistic but there is much of that right in, in perspective but um this is still a world of um talking about europe in general where monetary monetary economy financial resources were not much still there right this was still the the age of properly hard sturdy ruvet knights that carried out uh, some of the greatest enterprises from a still very ancestral background, right? And this was naturally truer if you contrast what could be a German knight uh, in his um, Italian expedition with, a, of course, a Lombard. Um, it could be even the same equivalent as a knight, but even just more stereotypically you see now a commoner, an infantryman, and what he saw in, in civic and identitary terms. And that mentality is also quite fascinating. Um, but we'll see this in, in other videos. I actually made years ago a video about the Battle of Legnano, but it's so old that uh, I, I realize it will help. First of all, to talk about that again, uh, it, but, and reconstructing it more properly. I mean, the essence is clear, right? About the 12th century, we don't have huge tactical details, but that battle is quite interesting uh, per se, and we will explain its military meaning later. Um, but also because, in fact, there is a broader uh, European standard set there as far as, especially infantry development is concerned. As you well know, I made some videos about the Italian communal armies, and uh, you can find that, if I'm not wrong, in the uh, Medieval Italian Warfare playlist. Right, so I grouped everything by national kind of uh, background era, military topics and not, etc. You can find it all there. So why do we start from the fourth expedition in Frederick? Because um, the background is too important to be discussed together with the rest. And it's actually the conclusion of of Frederick's enterprise. Um, um, and, and, and it is important as far as, especially what is overlooked as the still feudal background of Italy is concerned. Also, the of course, the German policy um, the German politics in general, actually. Uh, and because, of course, uh, there is a first settlement that Barbarossa succeeded in affirming in Italy at a point. At, at this point, uh, Milan had been destroyed. However, and we've seen this recently in the video about medieval Verona, um, a Veneto League had formed before the Lombard one, actually. Uh, and had successfully prevented the emperor from carrying out an important amount of political and strategic um, feats. Uh, also because they were blocking uh, the the Brenner Pass, right? The the Adige Etch Valley, right? So that Verona had historically been Ghibelline, but at this point, um, Barbarossa's policies had made her switch um, side. Also. Because, as we'll see now, that the main problem, of course, was not just the degree of, um, and not much, actually, even the degree of um, oppression, per se, but essentially the degree of, co of corruption of the German officials. The fact that um, at Ronca the Diet of uh, Roncaglia, Barbarossa had affirmed practically that all the, practically all, right, if you look at them, it was the, the control of um, any um, of the major sources of revenues that the communes had uh, essentially developed over the years. We're talking about taxes on roads, water, ports, markets, coinage, like everything was to be provided to the emperor, right? So uh, a situation that was already negotiated because at this point Barbarossa had just culturally... Um, acknowledge that things in Italy worked in another way from the overwhelmingly feudal background of Germany, the, the princely background of Germany, right? Where there were communes, but they were, they were nothing like in development, but especially in autonomy. Uh, the, 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 the ones that existed in the Po Valley. Um, 
uh, and that um, were intolerable for communities were literally booming, right? The wars of the Lombard League for a, for a while essentially consume an extraordinary amount of resources to fight against uh, the Hohenstaufen, but then when when the war is over, there, is, there are some of the major booms, like literally when you look at humanism, I mean, it was born at least as a consequence of those phases, right? Because uh, at this point, what is fascinating of this clash is that this is the peak of communal civilization in Europe, and at the same time, a feudal civilization in Europe, right? And and the wars between the Hohenstaufen and, and the Lombard leagues uh, exemplify that contrast, right? That the the attrition between these two um, worlds, that however are fundamentally overlapping by huge degree. In fact, what is fascinating is the the degree, uh, and that's also overlooked historically. I made some videos about that, about Conrad II, about 12th century Germany, also a bit like imperial ideology. Uh, we talked extensively about the Italian communes, etc. How much, especially the, the, the Lombard cities, were framed conceptually within the orbit of the German monarchy. Right. Let us say the empire such right that again, not even in in Germany controlled, uh, say, namely did, but in terms of of probably of what the monarchic power of the ruling dynasty was concerned, was not controlled. Like this area between Swabia, Franconia, um, Lombardy, essentially, was considered a bit like a, a single thing. Right. There was an important participation during the the 10th, 11th century of, say, of the Lombard vassals to even the German diets, it, it was considered all as one, right? And and Frederick, at, at some point, drafted properly a list of this, I think, even preemptively to the to the Italian expeditions of all the cities that were owed, of course, and, and because they traditionally had had, right, even in the times in which the, the German rulers were absent in Italy, um, to, the, to the emperor and they were in connection with, with him, Specifically, and that's impressive because there are just some cities of both, especially of Germany, right? There, there are lots of Lombard cities, then some German ones, and most German ones are not counted. So that tells you, just from a mental perspective, how at least that southwestern Ger um, German monarchic. Um, political culture was habituated to to see the connection with the Italic kingdom obviously enough because it was necessary to the Roman crowning right um, in uh, by the hands of the of the Pope something that of course as far as the say northeast Germany the, didn't you know the, didn't affect much you know what, what the imperial direction would, would have been so um, it's um it was an old knot that can't just be explained through, okay, Frederick uh, goes to Italy again and the thing starts. But it was something start dating back to, to, to centuries, to, to the same, again, the Carolingian ideology that the same Frederick uh, resumes is, is quite eloquent there. Um, at this point, we, we're looking at uh, the papal schism has already occurred. That is to say, uh, Frederick has, after the first expedition that was aimed at uh, naturally checking Milan, that, as you know, was the, practically the main reason why he, he descended, formally was for, for the crowning, and incidentally at that point also settling matters in the city of Rome, because and we made a video about that, that there was the old issue of Arnold of Brescia, the uh, literally the, the the Romans as a commune on their own had expelled the papacy. Just to tell you also how, because Rome doesn't figure much in communal history, because it was, of course, a bit thwarted by the the papal lordship in in the city. But the, 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 there is a massive mm, court there that had to be mitigated as well, and it was the emperor's task, of course, to protect the papacy equally. But after that, war had broken out. Between, in fact, the um, the the fact of the papacy, right, via the the the, the Veneto League and uh, and beyond, because obviously the, the the plan of of Frederick was to reunite all 
all of the Italian peninsula. Actually, at that point, did also Sicily, and so taking over the Siculo Norman kingdom and so on. Uh, and the papacy would subsidize largely the, uh, the the North Italians, in in part the Normans as well, and beyond. And so the, the war was essentially fought between these two powers. And Frederick had elected an anti-pope, right? So there was a pope now that essentially was embodying a bit what the Ottonians used to, to use popes like as um, imperial pawns and then naturally the pope in Rome that was against that. But of course the 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 church was split, right? Not the church of Rome at that point is a papal monarchy, but I mean other prelates that still saw, because this is also the interesting part of it, like the, the viability of the feudal order as essentially a the, the standard public institution, right? And because the, the the communes were relatively new at this point, they were not even one century old as an institution, right? Not as, of course, not as the, the communities were concerned, because the Etonians back in the day again they had accomplished what they did by, as you know, conferring power to the to the bishops that ruled the city. That is basically what the commune had taken over, even just as a prerogative, but very often, namely, acting on behalf of the bishop that had comital you know, powers since Ottonian times. So this is the interesting aspect of the story. But there were also f- uh, vassals, literally feudal vassals, especially in the areas that were not so, in fact, communally developed, um, such as Piedmont, where the Montferrat, in fact, also acted as the um, the main ally of the Hohenstaufen. and uh, this was true also for for central Italy at some levels, Spoleto, some other the, the March of Tuscany, there was still a um, the, the communes there would emerge later as as an important force that at, at will point will fight against the Emperor, but you know, more directly at the time of you know Henry the Seventh of Luxembourg. So completely different contexts. Um in any case, uh, also the life of a 12th century Holy Roman Emperor is pretty busy. As we were saying before, Barbarossa didn't stay in Italy most of the time. Right? We're talking about it in narrating courts mostly, but the most important power base, of course, of Frederick was in Germany. And uh, we've seen this, uh, again, in multiple videos, but also here and there in the regional series, for example, the role of Thuringia here as a, you know, most of what the Hohenstaufen were trying to revive in an anti wealth function, right? Also, we have seen it uh, in the video about the, mar- uh, the Markgraf shaft of Brandenburg uh, and, and more. So very complex and interesting topics, but today we look mostly at Lombardy. Um, uh, the Carolingian uh, symbology, ideology, propaganda, etc., was resumed by Barbarossa exactly in this moment of greater strain with the, the papacy during the schism by, of course, presenting the, the emperor as actually the, uh, the, the savior of the church, right? the protector, at least, of the church, uh, and in full, uh, um, kind of even, you know, Christological even uh, mission, uh, has also the resu- resuming of Caesar Papistic and Byzantine derived, because again, the Bolognese school was working on, as you know, on Justinian's code uh, that Frederick in that. Uh, founded dramatically in the reconstruction of philologically, um, juridically, and so on. And Charlemagne uh, was declared a saint, right, with the very obvious purpose of making Frederick obtaining the supremacy of the empire throughout Christendom. Right, the figure of Barbarossa there put himself enter the golden hall of Germanic imperial heroes together, in fact, with Charlemagne, with Otto I. The word consider, in fact, like like saints and saints uh, at this point, and, uh, you know, of course, in a world that had its own different understanding of history from ours, that there had been essentially 
everything had began with Constantine, because in, in a Christian perspective, that's how at least the, the historiography had sedimented the thing. Yes, they, everybody knew that it was a, a further past and other things, but just the cornerstones were Constantine, Charlemagne, also Otto I, by an important degree, and at, at this point, mostly the Holy Roman Imperial and, and probably the German ideology towards the late Middle Ages would naturally, uh, you know, uh, make of Barbarossa. Did. As in other countries, it happened similarly towards the, the monarchy figures, the, the 12th century chivalric hero, right? Uh, um, a role that he definitely deserved, also because, as you know, he died uh, during the Crusade, um, and, you know, he had accomplished, after all, so much uh, overall with this uh, undefatigable uh, personal energy that, again, is was truly Leonine um, in nature. In any case, um, other legions aside, such as the fact of, a bit like King Arthur, that, you know, Barbarossa should wake up once again at the end uh, of time, at least to defend, again, uh, Christendom and to, uh, to when, when the Empire will be in trouble. Uh, so there is a lot of mystique there, also, say, in German nationalistic uh, kind of unification times during Nazism and beyond. So he's definitely a, a mystical figure. Again, from a 12th century Germany that in many ways was so un still ancestrally mystical, right? Uh, Germany will be a fully feudal kind of Western Fra Frankish country just by the, by the 13th century. The 12th is already also from a military point of view kind of interesting. It was was already a, even if you look at its art, uh, its Romanesque, it's much more kind of, uh, you know, even the Gothic elements is, takes longer to, to spread. Uh, and you can see there probably still the world of the forest, of the swamp. Um, German knights often dismounted on this um, kind of tough German terrain. It's it's something there that still echoed the uh, you know the the the, the zeitgeist of the uh, Teutoburg uh, battle or the migration here. Consider that the Draconis will disappear in Western warfare in only in Germany in the in the 13th century, which is quite fascinating, indeed. Um, from the other side, uh, as we will see now, there is someone else, right? Um, I made a video about the night, the, the reliefs, in fact, of Modena Cathedral, the, 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 the Arturian cycle, um, uh, the Cathedral uh, frontal arc vault, that shows brilliant examples, in fact, of Italian knights and infantry. There are the bas reliefs of the uh, Roman gate in Milan that also are some of the finest and, and date literally to, to those very years of the battle of Lignano etc. So you have a, a pretty, I, I inserted them in, in, the, in the picture together with the German ones to give you a, a pretty hardcore idea of, even in fact of the dark and still kind of brutal um, and um, quasi-heroic dimension that still lived in, in, 12, in the 12th century West. So in autumn 1166, Barbarossa returned for the fourth time to Italy. And at this point, he mostly wanted to settle this persistent papal schism that had been eroding his authority. Uh, you know, he was excommunicated, so th this was a huge problem for, for, a, for any ruler uh, uh, at the time, and in greater scale for the, the ambitions that Frederick had, even more as a Holy Roman Emperor. After some months of political and military preparations, the emperor headed for Ancona in the in the marches and, and the Adriatic Sea in, in, in central Italy. This city was a maritime republic and had uh, historically been closed, just like Venice, that was um, her bitter rival, however, uh, with, with the Byzantine Empire, because you know, to, through the Adriatic, there was the gate to, 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 to the east, right, to the, to the Levant in general. And this city had, had a considerable Byzantine influence at the time. The Byzantines didn't, of course, want uh, Frederick to consolidate any kind of Western Empire because they knew that Constantinople would have been next. As a matter of fact, if 
Frederick's son, uh, Henry VI the Light, when his father was already dead, hadn't died himself prematurely, it would have not been the French and the Venetians who ca would have captured Constant Constantinople, but a few years before the Germans, interestingly enough. But it's just one of those things that wouldn't happen for this biological accidents that changed literally there are a lot in the history of the empire. I mean, the, the crossroad there between Philip of Swabia, Otto of Brunswick, Frederick uh, of Hohenstaufen, and naturally, and Innocent III, the Battle of Bouvines, uh, John of England, Philip Augustus VIII. Like, if you don't know that, you, you basically don't know anything, not just about the Middle Ages, but about the entire world. Uh, made several videos about that, and we'll, of course, keep coming prep prepotently on, on that topic. Um, but many of, of also those factors were kind of influenced, of course, with what was massively changing at this point. And Ancona was, at this point, supporting the imperial aims of Manuel I Comnenus. I made a video about him. If you're interested, there is all the Comnenoi playlist to, to explain better what, what was the situation from their side, how they were doing this, etc. Um, and then Frederick moved to Rome, forcing the same Pope Alexander III to flee the Orbs. This move was important because Frederick didn't bother himself with Lombardy more than much. He, he just wanted to reach Rome to settle the matter in the Holy City. But exactly for this reason, in 1167, the famous Lombard League was formed in the north. Um, and it spread, actually born in imitation of and developed from the League of Verona, the Veneto League um, of three years before, that had successfully, um, you know, um, say, prevented the emperor of enforcing control on, on, on the area that the, the, the communes had maintained their, their, their autonomy uh, in arms, right? There had been fights at the locks of the Adige there and pretty brutal episodes in which, of course, prisoners were caught, massacred. It, it's really that bloody as it sounds. So Frederick's move in central Italy made it possible a, a full-scale rebellion in the, po in the Po Valley. Milan, at this point, had been rebuilt, right, and quickly regained the, the, the leading role that, as the most, actually the largest city in Europe at the time, bear in mind, had had also in the rest of Lombardy, right? It, it vigorously returned to the line of regional political development that also, the Milanese rivals had tried for a number of years to counter by coordinating their forces around Barbarossa, right? Uh, the main enemies of Milan in the Po Valley were other Lombard communes that were... Uh, I made a video about the 12th century Milanese expansion territorially, chiefly Lodi, that had actually called the same Barbarossa in 1154, because the Milanese were bullying them and literally expanding beyond the Milanese district. So something completely ne never seen before in, in European history as far as this communal development was, was concerned. Um, and a lot of would actually side eventually with Milan against Barbarossa after you know the, the shortcomings of, of the German administration. Other enemies, however, more consistent ones, were the, the feudal lords we were saying before, especially uh, the, the, the Montferrat, even the Malaspina by a degree. Um, but this would eventually all kind of uh, be absorbed o over time by the same co within the same communal policy. right? That's what Barbarossa, as we were saying before, had already understood this time, that he couldn't rely, as uh, when he thought, when he stepped in, in Lombardy first, to just on just the traditional feudal hierarchy of the nobility, the, 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 properly the, the feudal one, the bishops, etc., he had to negotiate government with the communes, right? Uh, 
and there were some areas a bit decentralized, like Piedmont, like some areas of the Apennine, etc., where feudal power had remained in Italy, and most of this still entails some kind of communal participation, meaning that you can be, say, the Duke of Spoleto or the the the, Mar- uh, the, the Marquis of the Aleramics or these kind of things. But you're always going to rely fundamentally on, on your power in, in the city, right? Uh, the, the Montferrat had, for example, been provided by Barbarossa with some important strongholds in areas that were aimed at dominating cities like Asti or Chieri, etc. So at the end of the day, the, the, the trend, the, the trajectory was pretty evidently in favor of kind of a communal development. The, the matter still at this point was, you know, can we frame still this with, under a, a feudal hierarchy? Like it basically happens all over Europe or is there room for something else I mean the destruction of Milan had been a pretty traumatic event for the Lombards because um, the, um, the 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 Hohenstaufen were incredibly brutal you know this like uh, even later right when at the times of Frederick II that somehow resumed his grandfather's mask when, while coping with the Lombards that it were siding with him were let's say Say they advised the emperor by saying, you know, you you can't really think that these will back down because you you are you basically infringe on their liberties and you uh, start massacring them as as if if they if they don't right these will just fight harder right and that's exactly what what happened but in many ways uh, what was at stake was exactly that kind of authority, the possibility of the authority enforcement in a universal sense. Right? It, it, needless to say that the, a, a, let's say a victory um, like, uh, let's assume that the one of Lignano but with a reverse outcome would have definitely changed the history of Europe for uh, in, in many ways. We, we can't say whether the communes would have achieved some greater autonomy, but let's say sometimes the, the moral uh, approach uh, changes a lot of stuff uh, politically, socially, and you can shift major resources as a consequence of that. So it was really a hard fought battle, right? And the conquest of Italy would have definitely conferred the Holy Roman Empire the capacity of reuniting U- uh, Europe and the Mediterranean. I'm not keen about that, right? They, the later, just the French would arrive to almost accomplish that. With the with the Capetians, with the Angevins, but um, eventually, you know, time ran out. Big crisis of the 14th century. This thing was not possible. So the 12th century was the the, uh, the one of the Germans. The 13th was the one of the French. Um, and it, for different reasons, this this thing failed. Uh, the as we were saying before, main issue with um, Imperial policy at that point was, of course, absolutely no secessionistic uh, one of any kind, right? That was never, like, nobody was fighting there to deny the imperial authority as such, or the empire as an institution, none of that, right? The problem there was the degree by which the emperor could interfere in the... um, in the in the commun- communal costumes, and who was to be put in charge of that, right? And uh, in which relation it was to be with the communal representatives, like the German officials. This was emerges clearly from the sources that had disillusioned practically everyone because of their corruption. Uh, so this would have had to be a, some kind of an efficient government, uh, and or at least. One where the, the emperor could directly control in a also in a fair way. It turned out just in the idea that there was um, uh, an interference with the local liberties by officials that practically would just benefit personally from this and would divert an enormous amount of resources from the well-oiled and you know, developing communal administration. Um, 
Frederick's expedition in central Italy failed on account of the aforementioned epidemic, which broke out in his army again. The Byzantine chronicles say that, uh, you know, the 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 the, the Comneno had essentially agents in every Italian city, and that they would essentially put, uh, you know, poison or stuff, you know, in the uh, in the German in the German supplies to 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 make a, an epidemic break out. Uh, never underestimate in this sense uh, the degree, of course, of political permeability, as we were saying before. This is not just a matter between the Swabians and the Lombards. This is an, a fully internet. It's basically the single most important thing that is happening uh, in the West uh, at the time. Uh, so, in 1166, Frederick returned to Germany. Meanwhile, the Lombard League from the Veneto to the western Emilia and eastern Piedmont, so essentially great, the entire Po Valley practically organized itself into a sworn alliance of free cities. Uh, Albite, even feudal elements joined, such as the Marcus Obizzo Malaspina, who uh, held the important um, Apenninic passes between, in fact, the Po Valley and Tuscany, uh, and that came from uh, one of the most revered um, feudal lineages in, uh, in the Italic kingdom, which was definitely... Um, an emergency spy, uh, kind of warning uh, the emperor politically about the, the situation, the, the the deep dissatisfaction that was uh, that had spread in in the in Lombardy against his rule. Um, naturally, this alliance was consistently backed by Pope Alexander the Third, in honor of whom the name. Uh, Alexandria, Alessandria in Italian, was given to a new city, in fact, found, uh, founded in, um, today it's Eastern Piedmont, but technically at the time it, it was Lombardy, right? Lombardy is to be understood in, in different ways, like uh, in a broader cultural sense, uh, but during the 12th century. And th this was a new commune, right? It would remain, it would never be a particularly important one, it was one of new foundation, of medieval foundations, a city from scratch, differently from most of the other, essentially Roman-based, or even older, um, uh, centers of the, of the Italic kingdom. In any case, um, Alessandria was a thorn in the side uh, for the Marcus of Montferrat, right, had been built there exactly as a bulwark Right, uh, from from west to east, right. So, towards the direction of Milan, from the most faithful feudal ally of Barbarossa in Italy, Pope Alexander, that as I understand was celebrated, uh, because of course of the, oh, probably the ideological blessing that was given to the enterprise against an excommunicated uh, emperor. So, one of the most serious issues, definitely, could be measures could be taken by by the church that, again, was struggling against a schism. So another papacy that had been fabricated by by Frederick um, did his best um, in, in his turn to help the, the United Cities, right, to act conjointly. And specifically, he threatened anyone who wished to secede from the Lombard League or disobey its governors with interdicts and excommunication. Now, the Lombard League is quite interesting for how it, it was organized, because it, um, it um, represented essentially a, an, a, an incredible advancement in the political and military coordination of the Lombard forces. Italy had, uh, the Italic Kingdom specifically, uh, had some monarchic ambitions on its own until the early 11th century. Eventually that, uh, what had been historically a feudal rural nobility since Carolingian times, had urbanized 
as gentrified. I mean, these this were pretty much the, the same as uh, knights in, uh, in military and in lifestyle, etc. Then, then in the rest of Europe, except it had began to manage the city from there as well. In fact, the communes were uh, not a product as uh, kind of bit liberal um, modern idea of the thing would be of, say, some free people escaping the nobility. Actually, the, com the, the Italian communes are born, and I made a video about this and found it, first of all, exclusively for a military purpose. Right, The commune as such was, as we've seen before, a congregation of freemen in arms, and freedom there equated to nobility, right, of bearing arms as such, right. So, th there was th that's egalitarian sense that naturally in in Italy, differently from north of the Alps, derived mostly from the fact that people were kind of more per capita rich. They they had maintained a, a greater sense of probably of civic participation. These these communities were quite pride in their municipal identity uninterruptedly since Roman times. So there was something there it was deeply ingrained as the even as, as you can see in the same in, in the case of Milan, this kind of an aggressive mindset, right? Properly exiting the, the city gates, going to, to oppress the, the various neighbors and creating essentially a, a an, an an important territorial domination. Well the commune was founded by the milites by the consular class, by essentially the military, uh, the, the military nobility intended, in this sense, uh, as um, the the richest, the most powerful. The people would naturally had, say, house towers in the city, but obviously land outside of it, and that were greatly the product also of that kind of further feudal customs. If we want just to simplify them, in a in a military sense, and lifestyle, and creed, and and mentality that was present among, say, the the, the knights of Barbaros. Actually, again, they were different people. Um, they they were, in an important degree of time, literate. They they were much more acquainted with this kind of um, uh, large scale kind of economical. Um, say investment also with abroad with a with a city market with the with the idea of you know so specialized culture there there's a lot happening at that point it's all managed at this point the con the the communes are ruled by the consular class the military one right and as such they had also began to realize uh, that they could cooperate with one another. Normally these communes would fight against one another, but at the same time they had a, a previous awareness of the, the fact they had been part of a common background, mostly in fact dating back to the the Longobard kingdom that was pretty unitary as far as the Pauvala especially was concerned. The same part also in Tuscany. And the communal development greatly owes to the degree of actual public authority and uh, government centralization in, in the Longobard Kingdom and that kind of lived on in, in Carolingian and Antonian times was further enhanced as we've seen just by the, the emperors because it did work right and it was basically the only uh, case in in the world at the time because the other countries did have cities etc but they didn't have this degree of uh, first of all, of autonomy, yes, but also of political military power, of concentration. Here, basically, we're talking about tens of cities at 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 most some tens of kilometers of distance. So they technically developed, also culturally, politically, institutionally, all in the same way, right? We tend to see them as separated, as divided, but the actual thing is that they had an incredible kind of gluing sense of themselves and they would keep developing in that direction and the Lombard League is a proof of this is the proof of the the mounting capacity of putting together enough forces even to counter basically the most powerful military in Europe at the time and even managing to defeat it uh, in, in open field at a point uh, there are striking um in fact, military events here that we can't just 
uh, we will remember briefly uh, Legnano and Carcano. Carcano had already happened, telling the truth. There, the uh, the Milanese infantry, uh, in that case specifically, had um, basically because uh, at this point the milites and the pedites, so the the knights and the um, the, the the commoners of so the infantry, uh, marched uh, and fought, divided very often. I mean, there was a cooperation, a coordination, but sometimes, like in that case. Um, Movements were autonomous. Even the famous Carroccio is not a symbol of the commune. It's a symbol of the people, right? And it's a kind of a tonic symbol, as a matter of fact. The knights had much more kind of uh, heavenly standards. Well, in that case, German cavalry charged and broke, as was normal for the time. Um, the uh, the Milanese infantry, that was, quote, um, without the cavalry support. Then the Germans passed on the, the, the Lombard cavalry, and after a fierce fight, they defeated that as well. However, the infantry regrouped. Right? Normally, this um, you, you hardly see it even in medieval warfare. They they had been broken as a as a battle line, and they regroup and they march. Again, all this without cavalry support against the German camp, and they sack it. Right? And they basically managed to come back, uh, more or less intact. Right? Um, that, that's a very interesting battle because you can see how autonomous minded probably that the commoners were and how much also cavalry was somehow molded by the confrontation with these. Naturally the Germans here appear as, uh, like also in the later sources, are as incredibly um, aggressive minded. Like the reason in, uh, the, there are interesting studies about this um, and some may sound stereotypical, but the idea that the Germans were somehow just always throwing them ch uh, themselves in a charge, and w no matter what, even foolishly, ha full uh, foolhardily so, and um, and having to break through was like the a bit their um, their hallmark, right? The French were actually considered as they were superior knights because they had a higher collective training, but as far as this hot temper and Necessity to vent a sort of furor is, is kind of pretty evident from the sources. And the Italians seemed more contained and less versed for these immediate attacks. Consider, as we were saying before, what, what Germany was compared to, to Italy at the time. Um, it, it was a much more... Um, uh, this is tough, because it, it's not much, as we'll see now, that... that Italy was less military in nature. Actually, the, the Italians were pioneering what would arrive between the 13th and the 14th centuries, likely the most advanced um, uh, military in Europe. Um, but the uh, probably that sense of chivalric individualism and probably the knightly culture, but in a more traditional, primitive sense, was pretty much deeply ingrained in Germany, right? That is a country without borders, especially in the East, where they had to tame, say, the Cumans or other Mordiers, and um, the, the country was um, was an, a heraldic um, forest, right? Without, as we've seen, a, a strong central power, there was a, uh, a very kind of mob-minded mob um, sense of what um, the princely control of their lands re really was. So we've seen feuds between bishop and counts and so on in, in Germany, but more or less in similar times to this one. Um, so the, the the spirit of chivalry was much more alive, arguably, right? Perhaps because um, it's not that the Italians, is, of course, weren't obsessed just like the Germans with, I don't know, French literature and all the, you know, the, the chivalric epos, the the Italians had in the communes brotherhoods, sworn brotherhoods of warriors, you know, saying of, uh, as the wolves, as you know, the, the, the knights of King Arthur, and all this kind of stuff. But naturally, they were more civilized. They they were more kind of gentrified by a degree, and so th this could explain in part the some of the military outcome of of, of this battle. In any case. Um, even there, the the final Lombard victory is to be appreciated in something that was evolving also much more along the pattern of combined arms tactics and beyond. But always keeping in mind that feudal culture, feudal military culture was was also peaking, 
right, together with also this communal one. So again, it, it's a hell of a um, military uh, theater to analyze, and we hopefully will uh, at some point as well. And the league naturally was a league, meaning that um, it was not just a military alliance to coordinate the this various contingency. The army was say they 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 assembled at some point. They said, okay, we have to go to war against the emperor. This commune will send forty knights. This this one will send uh, one hundred, etc. And we will put them together. Naturally, Milan had the lion's share in this, just because, again, it was the largest city. Um, but th there was um, an important degree of coordination of kind of also political, legal, administrative uh, development in parallel of that was um, making these communes growing in a startle direction just because of the interaction, the conflict, the competition within them still of course existed during even at the peak of the war um, with Barbarossa, right? It, the League was called properly as a societas, right? So the idea of the soci, just like in, in the ancient uh, Rome, were properly the allies that had to contribute militarily, in this case for one another, because there wasn't quite of a true center of the league. I mean, Milan was, but it was, you know, say, uh, because it was the most, uh, the heaviest, right? And But there was no such, like, a center uh, in absolute terms. Um, and there was a college of rectors ruling the league, right? And they naturally were representatives of the various communes. Uh, that work together to essentially negotiate how this interaction had to occur because it cost a lot, just not just the war, but of course you have to be sure that everybody's full in. So also the papacies we've seen supports them um, in in ways that would ensure such it would pressure also some communes that maybe were more or less convinced to to, to behave more in line with the others and so on. The aim of the League was to obtain from the Empire the, the recognition of their political, administrative, and jurisdictional accomplishment that the individual members of the League had earned right throughout the, the, the generations, right? Through a long path, in fact, that um, was completely autonomous because most of, of, of the time this this development occurred was uh, just the same communes were invented nobody created them but themselves right so um the uh, the of course they were recognized as an autonomous community uh, of, of subjects whose uh, costumes had to be respected but in this sense the new decrees promulgated at roncaglia in 1158 had as we were saying before deprived them of most of their uh, of their revenues, most of the control on what they had accomplished, and this was seen as we did it, right? Why do you have to take it away from us, right? You are here, like as was also the traditional deal, right, to protect our pre-existing rights. This is the same concept of the Magna Carta, right? Um, now, Italy, like most of Europe, is under civil law, right? So technically, on what Frederick was reviving at the time, and, and that's the point, that at the time the emperor was claiming instead, in fact, a, a, actually a Roman prerogative, where the emperor is the state and controls literally everything, by law, right, not by accomplishment, not by power, not by rec free recognition of the subjects in virtue of his, uh, of his imperium, right, but because, in fact, a, a centralized state, a fully one, an absolute state, in theory, had to be affirmed. And it's worth noticing that those, um, that concept of absolute and indefeasible sovereignty of the empire, um, which Frederick had claimed on the authority of Roman law, was updated by uh, the same Italian jurists, right, that, uh, of course, were also aligned at some point with the empire, as far as, um, at least, Benefits could could derive, in fact, with the Constitutio Habita of the Barbarossa, the, the Bolognese Studium acquired, a, in fact, a great role within within the Empire. You know, that is technically the first European university, and it was born 
chiefly on the base of legal studies, right? And exactly to recover Roman law in ways that were, by the way, much more flexible and less uh, teleological than we think. It's just during the 13th to the 14th century, Roman law gets kind of fully affirmed and basically the entire juridical doctrine starts from it. And or, of course, the integration of the previous costumes and laws, etc. Uh, in it. Now, uh, okay, let's not open the, the parentheses, but you, you realize that, that there are also feudal laws that uh, were issued previously by the emperors that were part, let's say, they had to be integrated with, um, or better, with, that Roman law had to be integrated with, because that was the original idea, especially as far as the doctrine was concerned, because they, the jurists were not recovering, Rome. they were doing it alone, um, the emperor just came to exploit it, but um, they were doing it not because they wanted to inspire, say, to to import Roman law in 12th century Italy, but they just wanted to fix some lacuna that existed in the pre-existing customs, were very complex, right? Most of the law there was essentially some Romano-Germanic law uh, before the Longobard one was the base uh, uh, because Theodoric had previously legislated, those were importantly Romanized laws, and the Longobard one was kind of unique in making most, in fact, of the, of the, in fact, Lombard identity of the time. And the and then after the Carolingian conquest, all the imperial ones, plus customs that had formed over the centuries, um, such as the, technically the communes were, in spite of the fact that again they were literally claiming to act just on comital prerogatives deriving from the bishop that had been essentially, that were operating on behalf of concrete. Now, problems in Germany and Central Europe broadly meant kept Frederick at home for six years. This time was spent by the Lombards to recover much of, of the power lost. So much that Barbarossa launched a fifth expedition to Italy in 1174, which resulted uh, in an unsuccessful siege of Alessandria. The Germans tried to storm it from land and river, and they they were repelled. Th this was a very important uh, symbolic victory, because... Of course, Alessandria was, as we've seen, relevant as far as especially the, the Marquis of, of Montferrat w was concerned. The possibility of, ex of receiving reinforcement from Piedmont in, into the, the imperial uh, expeditions in, in, in Lombardy. But more than else, it bore, it was a bit like Stalingrad, right? You know, it bore the, the name, you know, terrible comparison, but uh, considering the ideologies behind it. But um, the, uh, ah, except I didn't think about the German one, but again, there is nothing nationalistic or socialistic in the, the Holy Roman Catholic Empire, which is, you know, something else. Um, given that it, it bore the name of, of the Pope, that's what I really wanted to mean. Um, and this brought um, to the to Lombard cities actually uh, kind of boasting their, their boasting their morale. Um, and in fact, Barbarossa's nego uh, negotiations failed, right? Um, and these are the events that hopefully we will see it in a better strategic and tactical fashion in other videos. It would lead to the celebrated military engagement at Legnano that lays between Milan and the Ticino River in 1176, right? So uh, at this point, Barbarossa was essentially descending from the north and he was to join um, forces with some, you know, allies in the south and the Milanese and, uh, and their allies thought, well, to, to get out of their fortified cities and to engage the emperor in battle. And Legnano is a hell of a battle, technically, because you have, um, especially as far as, again, as the aforementioned uh, infantry resistance is concerned, because this was a rather uh, typical engagement, um, and pretty simple. The uh, knights' battle lines would clash, and the infantry 
as far as we understand, because there aren't so many you know, specific studies on this, but formed essentially a, a battle line on its own, in this case in the rear of the cavalry, at some distance, right, with the carroccio and all. They, they had entrenched, uh, in, uh, they had dug up some trenches. There, there are some studies on where the, the battle did actually take place, and we think we've spotted it, and there is still some kind of, in fact, of, uh, uh, of uh, a relief. Uh, difference there because it was uh, dug back in the day and or it or it exists on the base of some streams etc because they were reinforced and when the Lombard because this was Milan plus allies right um, cavalry was crushed by the German and, and Italian one uh, they uh, of course the, the Lombard cavalry fled the field leaving the infantry alone to face uh, the imperial cavalry. Now, th this normally in, in other parts in Europe would end uh, with just the infantry breaking and not with saying sent. They, they, the Lombards realized there that if they abandoned the position, it would have just been slaughtered better. So they put up a stubborn resistance which basically halted the charges of the imperial cavalry. Um, the, the Lombards were allied around, again, the people symbol of the carroccio that was essentially a cart with a, with a, with a structure on it, with, a, with bells, with, with, a, uh, with a cross. There were priests actually praying from it. It's, it's as if it had been the, the same church with, with a pulpit. And uh, so just think even scenographically what, what it is, right? With all the mess, the, the, the shouts, people dying, bleeding out, and, and uh, over the dust, etc. This this kind of angelic figures speaking and and boosting the morale of these commoners that are pretty damn well equipped. If you look at their, um, you know, at the sword, at the evidence, etc. And they they are fanatically actually standing their ground because they know that in any case a defeat for them it would never be good. Or even if they survive, um, they would have there would have been just more power given to to the to the elite. They would have not. And they had been maturing their own progress because they realized also that the knights necessitated of the infantry, of course, to fight. Um, we find interesting weaponry there, um, also properly in an anti-cavalry fashion. However, if the the clash had been going on at this point in Europe, we are in the second half of the 12th century. Cavalry is the decisive arm. They would have had the worst. Um, I mean, the infantry would have had the worst of it. What happened is that the fleeing Lombard cavalry was rallied when they encountered a group of Brescian knights. Brescia was another Lombard city that were arriving on the battle. This is interesting on the battle because you understand how composite it was, right? How every city, like with messengers, uh, warned each other, such that they sent their own contingent. And this unit, plus the rallied uh, rest of the Lombard cavalry, arrived on the field and while the Imperial Cavalry was engaged against uh, Lombard infantry, they charged in their flank and rear, right? So at this point, the Imperial battle line was cut in half, and uh, the Imperial banner fell. Barbarossa himself, that was, again, a hell of a, at this point, Monarchs are really just out there on the front line. They they fight directly. They're expected to be knights, and Barbarossa is one of the most hot-blooded ones ever. He's a hell of a warrior, but he's unhorsed, right? And as you know, banner down, emperor is not seen anymore. The imperial army collapses, right? And it is a massacre. Also, lots of prisoners are taken. It's just the imperial banner. It, it's just a disaster. Right. This thing, again, it, it was a, uh, an imposing force. Uh, the Italians were more, but we don't know so much in detail how, um, how much, actually, especially from the German side, the infantry was, because uh, there was plenty of Lombards there, too. And in any case, Frederick um, disappeared for, like, I don't know, some days before he reappeared far north, right, having essentially escaped through the forest. So the, um, Lombard was, was also not really as you could see today. It was much more full of forests, swamps, etc. Because uh, he, 
of course the the Lombard forces had been pursuing the uh, the, the fleeing enemies had hunted them down. So you can't imagine just we, we don't know what happened to to Frederick during those days, but you understand that he had been hiding and you know if he had been captured or worse killed it would have been a like a a much more even serious event than it, than it already was. This was a clamorous victory of the Lombard League over the Imperial forces that from there on were not able to reconstitute themselves. It was a full, again, pitched battle. What is interesting about the infantry, I forgot to mention, is that when the cavalry uh, returned to the field, they seemingly passed to the counterattack. I mean, they crossed the same ditch that they were defending, and they began to attack the knights hand to hand. Like this is also pretty, you know, it's spirited. It Legnano echoed in Europe. We know that the the communes, the rustics from all over this, began to look at the Lombards, saying, "Wait, wait but you know, if these guys can't f just face, like in the the psychological impact of facing a a 12th century imperial knight, you, do you realize what it means?" What it, what it means to, to withstand a cavalry charge. It's one of the single most brutally traumatic events that can ever happen to you. Uh, and and these people had, you see, the, the, the communes, the rustics, had been brought under the, the feudal elite in a sense of their own moral inferiority. They were, they were thought to be lesser people, and they managed instead here to demonstrate that they could standard ground, which was already a huge deal against the manifested imperium itself, and by defeating it, actually showing that they had the imperium, that God had given them those rights to self-determine. Um, that is powerful. That is something that definitely echoed all over uh, Western Europe as a, um, as a signal of actually what, what would have happened. This thing went on. At Corte Nuova, there was a similar situation in the, against Frederick II and uh, eventually uh, the 13th, especially the beginning of the 14th century, will open to infantry, purely infantry victories, that is to say, without the help of cavalry in Europe. Um, but um, the development of the Italian infantry at this time during the 12th and 13th century, we're looking literally at the best that exists. And also for um, the early 14th, uh, uh, at the earliest, even as a as an end uh, moment, but still, right, remarkably so. Um, contemporary, like, the most updated historiography is basically discovering that what we thought the normal races like kind of military development in Europe had been not fully understood uh, for medieval times, right? In other words, we brutally underestimated um, these military developments. Actually, it's not even the Lombard League or Lignano specifically, but what happens slightly later that simply nobody has started, starting from the Italians themselves and that now you know, we are realizing that instead uh, was really beyond what, what we thought. In any case, um, at this point, uh, the Lombards had de facto won. Um, it was uh, the, 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 the major political and strategic balance had been shifted. Of course, operations continued by a degree. But the defeated emperor um, opened for talks from a kind of very different position. And since the cities had no wish, of course, to forsake the cause of Alexander III, who had backed them, and that, you know, even if he also embodied that sense of, actually, of Im imperium and papacy symphony, that, in this sense, God had showed that Frederick had not deserved, um, they solemnly met with Alexander himself at Venice, in 1177, Venice was out of all this, but of course, um, a stronger imperial presence just next door. It was very unlikely for Venice to be captured, let's say, militarily speaking, as you know, but in, uh, in these events. But Venice wanted things around not to become too oppressive, right? So uh, she managed to, to mediate <laughs> such talks and was prestigious for her as well. And uh, in 1177, and this put an end, at least as far as also the emperor was um, concerned, to, to the schism, right? That was recomposed. 
and a truce, in fact, was arran uh, arranged uh, with the Lombard League until the Peace of Constance on the Rhine that was agreed in 1183. Right, and here we'll, we'll explain essentially what the Lombard representatives uh, achieved with Frederick in that uh, piece. Between Legnano and Constance, you understand, there are seven years. Um, and during the wait, the Lombard League began to fragment as uh, unitedly most of the threat had passed. In fact, Frederick uh, was maintaining his imperial prerogatives and ideology, etc., but was acting with um, the communes with, you know, definitely a resigned awareness and kind of moderate policy, because he had, he had understood that, again, uh, th there were no resources, right, to carry on the struggle, and he had to let go, which for somebody who had descended several times just fine, spending great part of his life in this project must have been really, you know, heavy, and that's where you can't test his, his mental strength, because he wouldn't collapse, he wouldn't, I mean, people can literally die uh, out of these blows, but uh, he, he restarted, Right, with in, in other directions, he eventually decided to participate to the crusade, etc. So, he kept, especially paving the way for his successors, for because the German, uh, you know, the, the succession was always delicate. So he managed to, to affirm some dynastic continuity. Again, the the old Bill marriage was was uh, a major uh, accomplishment uh, internationally. And uh, reconferred a lot of length to uh, to, to the Swabian uh, universal uh, ambitions. However, in a very changed uh, reality as far as the Italic Kingdom was concerned. Now, talking about Constance, this would deserve a better video on its own. But let's try to do it briefly, then we can come back on it. The, the peace treaty signed between... Uh, the Emperor and the Lombard uh, representatives conferred the profound changes which had come about in, in the relationship between them after the war. Uh, it was presented formally as a privilege granted in perpetuity by the Emperor. This was very important because there was, and this is, uh, I can't stress it enough, I mean, from, from an Emperor that had been defeated to granting perpetuity uh, a right of um, political autonomy of that degree now, in which, of course, the emperor was always present, because the Lombards would never want not there to be an emperor. As they were proud imperial subjects, and now arguably more than ever, right, and they would never imagine anything different, um, meant to, from an imperial side, to share the imperium with them. Right, this was the most important thing, that in order to keep the empire together, the Lombard uh, um, communes were properly uh, relied on by the emperor himself. We'll see now how. Right, there was a literal switch from the feudal hierarchy to the communal one, in terms of the, of the imperial administration. Um, this of course, also confirmed uh, Frederick's position as the supreme source of legitimation. So, if you are the emperor and you claim a perpetual right, it's because you are the first one who is called to respect it. Right? So, you expect to be just that absolute power right, in the world. When you look at the actual content, uh, you, um, you realize, of course, the rights born of custom as the broad autonomy for the communes was maintained. These entailed essentially the urban jurisdiction. It meant that the old order, where in theory was just the emperor ruling through the bishops and the, the vassals, was over. It was the commune that was recognized as owning those prerogatives as the same communes had, as we've seen, developed them. And generally speaking, given their juridical sophistication that had been quite spot on in kind of inventing basically the um, the legal um, legitimization for 
again stepping in on behalf of the bishop as we've seen before acquiring the, the, the comital rights um, etc and there there are interesting researches on this topic by the way because uh, some and even Milan seemingly didn't for 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 an important amount of the 12th century did uh, stress the fact that the bishop still had a comital power interesting thing it's also difficult to find actually in um, as published content but th there are again deeply interesting things about this um, and not only the jurisdiction on the city but over the surrounding countryside and sometimes even over a wider area this was basically a full capitulation of the empire through the recognition that now the Italian communes could expand even beyond their district, what had been the traditional, in fact, order of the, you know, administratively, locally of the empire. These districts were the overlapping essentially with the ancient diocese or the civitatis or pagi of the broader Roman and, and eventually Germanic empire. Um, and they had been the... the political territorial framework on the base of which the, the, in fact the, the, the base of, of the imperial hierarchy had been working. Now it was being said that what Milan had done say, against Lodi for example that had triggered the same Barbarossa's descent in the Po Valley was uh, if not completely legal but it was accepted right uh, at least with, again with some reserves because reservations because the as we will see now, the emperor would claim that still all this had to be done with the emperor's supervision and, a, and acceptation, of course. But in practice, this meant that they would simply let it happen, right? And we will see now how. Uh, how? Well, with norms which um, would formally ensure the ruler ultimate political and jurisdictional control on these mechanisms. Um, this is how, generally speaking, medieval government worked. I mean, there is an app, uh, a universal authority, so this is meant to uh, essentially have the ultimate saying on everything, but it's it has to say that, right? If you don't hold a diet, if you don't uh, step in the place, you don't le legislate, you you can't control everything and things will simply go on autonomously on their own right so if you don't say anything technically nothing happens right um and or even if you say something against it as we've seen there have been all these wars fought just over it um you still couldn't have your own uh, will enforced the cities importantly maintain the right to choose their own consuls as heads of the commune. The consuls would receive their investiture from the sovereign or his representative, which meant, as we'll see now, that it will be a guy, technically, a sort of um, imperial envoy that had to, to stay there watching what happened and, uh, however, factually not accomplishing much. The consuls had to swear loyalty to, to either the emperor or his representative, so as the empire in general, so recognizing that authority, that again, the, the Lombards didn't have any problem with, because they weren't interested in the legitimizing the, the empire. Um, and the only exception actually in this imperial um, control would be where the, 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 the cities... Um, the, the 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 custom of certain cities demanded that the emperor be placed under the temporal power of the bishop right so uh, the this was um tricky as well cuz the bishop as we've seen in most of these communes wasn't quite governing anymore i mean the bishop was the same commune now so uh, it, it was a way to save face by saying, well, in theory, just remember that in Ottonian times we had bishop, you had bishop counts that are, that are the true representatives. And the commune simply said, okay, well, we'll basically oblige the bishop to make us do whatever the hell we want. So it's your representative. 
and we will do the thing anyhow, right? This is quite interesting. Also, it was established that in the exercise of justice, appeals against the sentences of city bodies should, in matters of greater importance, be referred to the emperor. Um, so that the there was this concept it was also deeply ingrained in Lombard administration since the the Longobard times that is to say every subject of course can appeal to the king to the emperor and thus to to receive justice right um, however in this the emperor also was to delegate the actual judgment to his own representative in the city or within the bounds of the diocese, because as we've seen, he would operate still through the episcopal, within the, the episcopal uh, milieu, um, who would be under the obligation to pass judgment, right, according to the city's laws and customs. What does this mean? It means that even this um, imperial mm, official that would have been called to solve certain particularly thorny matters would operate first of all through the uh, episcopal administration that however had still to uh, essentially uh, respect right the uh, communal constitutions which naturally had modified also the same episcopal jurisdiction as we've seen in in, in, in their favor and thus, also this aspect means that the actual imperial power was quite limited. It was also established the right of the cities to erect fortifications, which was an enormous deal. That during the war, you know, had been particularly important. Milan had had its walls raised by Barbarossa. It, the locks on, on the Adige were crucial because they prevented the passage from Germany. They had to make all a uh, kind of a hell of a tour around the, the pre-Alps to, to, to actually get in the Po Valley from the north. Um, and it, um, it it was traditionally a public prerogative. These fortifications naturally were promised to be built uh, to, to, to help the empire, at least to be put in theory at disposal of the empire uh, and uh, helping, generally speaking, the imperial cause in preserving the rights and possessions in, in Lombardy, right, and to thus to subsidize the sovereign on his visits on the region through them, right, the fodder particularly was important because it's just properly the fodder for the horses. That was a, say, it was in relative terms the most important right that the uh, communes managed to, to, to maintain under their control, but in theory, again, always to, to provide it to the emperor when he was in need. The position of the emperor at the head of the feudal hierarchy was also specified by Frederick, which again would have not had to fear from that in a, in a formal sense, but it, it was important to reassert, um, also internationally, to say, look, yes, I, I got defeated, but here nobody is disconfessing my authority as such, right? So, yet is, you are, uh, the concept is that um, these subjects are still uh, loyal and dutiful towards the empire and nothing along that pattern has quite changed, right? What were the consequences of the Constance resolutions? Well, they were enormous in scale. Um, we will talk about German policy per se uh, in another video, but as far as the Kingdom of Italy was concerned, um, this opened to a phase um, of incredible growth, because um, not only all these autonomies were fundamentally uh, recognized right after decades of tension and struggle uh, between Frederick and the Lombards, but also the the order deriving from the, the the political compaction 
that the league had achieved the much better defined prerogatives of the communes the just the, uh, the the broader expansion of 12th century Europe brought these centers to to prosper at an unprecedented level also politically speaking these are the moments in which all that force for example of the peditas that we remember before um, that had been channeled uh, against the emperor and that had shown to, to be necessary for the militas to, to defeat him like Legnano showed because without that battle uh, that the infantry line you know there would have not been even a cavalry victory afterwards brought the the people the commoners uh, to fight also in the city for their own prerogatives over the militas that exactly in those years just like the rest of uh, european uh, chivalric class were locking their prerogatives and so lots of interesting developments would occur from that chiefly the introduction of the podestas that would be that would further enhance the kind of the statal direction of the communes the establishment of kind of more super partas and thus unitary uh, government right uh, th th and this is just to make the long story short uh, there was an expansion in every field naturally the communes immediately uh, used their autonomies to fight against one another which is also very interesting uh, as they were doing before um, at this time there is not much of a broader prevarication but naturally there is the development of more or less important centers this had been reflected by the way also in the Treaty of Constance that had actually dealt with each commune separately this is very interesting like every commune had a history of its own um, juridically in, in the relation with the empire a certain political weight etc so uh, it's obvious that Milan had a different treatment than Cremona or, uh, say, Monza or other other centers that were also entering in her orbit uh, by by a degree, right? So it was a, a great like opening a dam, right? What is interesting to observe, and today we didn't focus too much on, is the treatment by the empire of the feudal lords and. Um, in the communes in parallel right because the communes were de facto becoming city-states and there was after the imperial defeat some extra jurisdictional autonomy that the feudal seigneuries already legally established in Italy received in fact and these had originated uh, to some extent in the functions of count and marquis that as we've seen had been exercised for more than a century by the great families of the italic kingdom and by their individual branches or or by their vassals right um, in part and this was also important because in germany there was a, an enormous um, fight over it the manner of the allodial seigneuries there is to say some possessions that were inalienable and uh, and they were controlled by these vassals but they were somehow felt especially in Italy to be part of public um, power at least by the Emperor in this case you see Frederick had tried to dislodge um, uh, let's say to undermine at least uh, his cousin Henry's power right? by invading Saxony he had also been exiled and many people see this as you know Barbarossa just wanted to destroy Saxony and annexating it to the to the Einstein and domains etc it was none of that technically right the reason why he went at war against Henry is actually the fact that he that the latter was bullying the ecclesiastical lordships in the north uh, uh, Rhine and uh, Westphalen uh, and given that great part of the imperial authority was based on the ecclesiastical support Frederick could not just sit there right everybody was harassing uh, others right even the same ecclesiastical lordships were doing the same against 
uh, each other by a degree and uh, against lay powers. Um, but there was this matter that when Henry was exiled, Frederick didn't touch his allodium because that would have meant, first of all, to set to, to make the entire Germany rebel because that was that privatistic mentality was so deeply ingrained in among the German princes that you couldn't properly touch those by custom those territories because these were the hardcore of a, what was felt as a fully and privately possessed uh, in fact property that nobody not even the emperor that in theory as we've seen in some, with the as it had been actually at a, at a point that the the case not just in the Roman but also in the Germanic tradition, especially the Frankish one from which the Holy Roman Empire emanated, um, as um, as a personal possession of the king, right? So these uh, allodial signories uh, that the the Italic vassals owned uh, after Constance were after Lagnano sanctioned with Constance, were, um, of course, uh, something that, as, as much as the communes had mm, never been quite directly controlled, just by their nature, by, by the emperor, right? But they had just constituted the, an important part of these vassals' power that had also operated in favor of, of the empire. In Frederick Chancery was now said to distinguish most of the time between the allodial possession of seigneurial holdings and the exercise of powers of jurisdiction, which were considered um, to be of a sort of public nature and susceptible to legitimization and inheritance only if conferred by the ruler, directly or indirectly through feudal investiture. Um, in other words, th this was an attempt to, mm, say, guide from the distance the management of those allodia in a type of policy that had been enacted by uh, Conrad II already mm, with the, actually with the... Mm, the, the Edictum de Beneficis, right? Uh, we made a video about Conrad II in 1037, and that's uh, together with the capitulary of Quercy sur Roise, it's of Charles the, the Bald. It's one of the most important, in fact, uh, it's the second most important feudal constitution ever emanated. And Conrad II emanated it properly in the Italic King. It was for. for just for the kingdom of Italy, then it was extended to the rest of the empire. And both Lothair III uh, in 1136 and Frederick I in, in 1154, when he first stepped in Italy, had tried to consolidate. However, even this attempt uh, failed, right? And the reason why they could initially think it, to make it work is that the uh, as we've seen, there had been some um, Italic vassals that had been loyal to Frederick. It, it's worth mentioning that um, William of Montferrat, after what what happened, um, uh, defected uh, as well, because you know, uh, in 1176, as we've seen, the, the entire political and strategic projectional capacity of the empire shrank dramatically and so there were new opportunities even for these vassals locally right um, and even though again such um, as we just said such um, a lot of were seen more like public uh, means to that would remain so so that the vassal could say that just he would much more directed with the emperor in a sort of in an attempt to maintain the feudal hierarchy just powerful even in the same Italy, these allodia were unavoidably uh, incorporated into the communal uh, dominions, right? They, they ended up in there, right? It, they had been, as we've seen, substantially feudalized for these, not just for these um, 
vassals to consider them as, of course, their own prerogative, but also for the emperor to show that they could confer the investiture for such fiefs as well. Um, but in a situation in which the, the imperial control on Italy had uh, evaporated once again, the feudal presence in Italy was too uh, scanty to uh, make of this Alodia kind of a landmass that could stem the, the communal expansion. Right? And so they were gradually absorbed. And there is not just a uh, you know struggle reason in this. I mean, it's not just the fact that communes became more powerful. Uh, it is, but also in the measure in which the, the Lombard League had enhanced, as we've seen dramatically, the military solidarity of the various uh, uh, leaders, right? The various noblemen mostly, that, as we've seen, still the military class that was in charge. And thus, it was kind of impossible, say, for Montferrat or the Malaspina or whoever to simply being out of the game, as if, you know, those fiefs were not part of of Italy, as it was developing with, with all those, uh, you know, the accomplishments that they, these men, individuals, these houses wanted to be part of at the same time. So it was impossible to stay out. It was literally a new age. After the war, everything changed. The, the, the Italian communes were much more intertwined than before, uh, they were much more, again, reliant on one another for military support. They, they knew how to do it. They had been investing in that. They had been developing the, the infrastructures, the, the administrative capacities, and so on. And, and they had just had a, you know, we can say a military overproduction or something. That They had to spend those forces somewhere, and that's what they, they, they did so. And very often, also, the, uh, the feudal element was very very qualitative from a military point of view and it was important to confer these uh, more marginal feudal lords actually a military interesting a military command right because they 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 were not as dangerous like another commune could be uh, and they were uh, they could be lured, right, just in being part of the commune having a connection even with that vassal with, with that feudal power by welcoming it and, uh, you know, uh, making it par take part in the in the communal politics and warfare, which is quite interesting with all the social benefits deriving from that, right? This is crucial. So you understand it's a devastating picture as far as the imperial side of the story was concerned because everything was loosened at best, right, in terms of possible influence in how the, the communal development had to to go right they were just let virtually free to pursue what they were doing before in the age of Barbarossa and de facto the communes were self-governing cities now as much as the independent lords were Right. And they were literally uh, achieving that degree of power uh, by European standards. So, now the, the feudal world was shattered by this in general. Like the 12th century uh, witnesses, of course, the crisis, what the, say that the system had been since the 10th. Uh, for, for many reasons, there is probably another worldview there is there are other studies there are other mindsets there are they're actually all very traditional still and so that's also where you have to frame the accomplishment of the Lombard League per se and the importance conferred by the imperial investiture of the consuls the swearing allegiance of allegiance by consuls and citizens in the in the negotiations of 1183 uh, revealed, um, of course, the intention of both the Empire and, and the Lombards to essentially uh, equate juridically the um, cities to the seigneurial hierarchy. 
right? And thus making properly the communes the authors of the stabilization and the safeguard of the empire in that region, right? There is a hierarchic profile of subordination with the emperor at the top, the subjects at the bottom. At the end of the day, there is uh, an incredible uh, imperial delegation to these communities. Mm -hmm. The Peace of Constance definitely expressed a, an important civilizational accomplishment. Right? Both the Empire and the Lombard communes were sensible. Right? They actually agreed uh, on on a broader view, of course, of how the, 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 the mechanics had won. Even if the communes had um, had won, they had the upper hand in a way. They, they were, as we've seen, not anxious to go out to war with, with the Empire just for the sake of it. They were just essentially getting what had already been theirs and they were content with it. And, the, and in exchange, we're just recognizing imperial overlordship as it was; it had always existed, and ha as the the same uh, Lombards had appealed to, right? At, even actually, uh, as soon as Frederick had been elected in Germany, and how it had also always been technically for for the Italic Kingdom, the the Holy Roman Empire, um, the German rulers, and so on. Um, it was an important equilibrium. Right? And you can argue that such fulcrum of, constituted by the new Italian situation mm, had a major consequence, not just in the local development, but it was fundamentally helping the, uh, the affirmation institutionally of some autonomies that couldn't help actually to strengthen the role of the empire. There was a, a collaboration uh, between the itinerant Curia of the Emperor in Germany and Milan's restored centrality in Lombard. Contacts remained strong. Uh, there was, again, a properly re-established uh, institutional stability where the, properly the relation had been clarified. Right? The, the actual problem was not settled, was the one with the papacy. Also, the uh, imperial possessions in central Italy and uh, probably the relation with the, the vassals there and the prerogatives were, were uh, a matter yet to, to solve, right? Uh, this is important to stress. Like, in Constance, Frederick dealt fundamentally with the members of the Lombard League. The rest was, um, of, of the Italian kingdom, was left... Um, I'd say still unsettled and there were huge issues dating to again mostly about the, the papal states as they were which, which kind of lands pertain to the empire which to the papacy and so those were things that wouldn't be settled until the second half of the following century right and in a time in which as you know uh, the empire had actually even shrank again in in, in power and so the the um, the the picture here i think um is um it's always fascinating to describe i'm glad to have made this video specifically but we will have to discuss this in much greater detail at some point because it's just from a political or a civical or a juridical military point of view it's all worth noticing in in great uh with great attention also as far as the background, right, the early expeditions, those are really something and, you know, properly today we, we didn't stress that properly the hammering nature of Frederick's policy, right, in Italy. So the that must be understood. Also the kind of the compromising part is, is always crucial to understand because these were still subjects, right, they were still people that Barbarossa had to win the support of. So it was also a matter of that and there are some factors that are overlooked in that uh, discussion, let's say, because uh, there were important cultural differences as we were saying before and this didn't 
play particularly well out. But considering the Holy Roman Empire continued until the 19th century and that essentially it remained framed on uh, these two major uh, kingdoms uh, interaction, well it, it seems to me that what occurred in the second half of the 12th uh, is uh, even more worth of attention for recovering kind of a sense of just European identity and tradition, but also showing how the uh, imperial standards are always tested, right? And the imperium can be held by anyone as long as they deserve it, right? So there is something in the, this clash that, uh, uh, rather than, than a cultural struggle, should be observed as... Um, the pursuit towards a common goal, a common vision of the world, a universal one, right? And this is naturally being framed in a nationalistic term, both from the, from the German side and the Italian side, especially during the age of, of independence of these nations that, however, you know, were allies, at least at that point. You know, it's true that the heir of the empire was rather uh, Austria. But, let's say, from an ideological point of view, this is definitely not the correct way of reading it, right? And fortunately, today, we are uh, historiographically pretty much there in terms of, you know, getting it right um, from quite a, a while, because it's a hyper-studied topic. But as I always say at the beginning of the video, when you, you meet with popular culture, you tend to encounter some at this point it's not even prejudices it's literally that people don't even know what happened right they don't even know these things existed at all right the generation z and even less that the one coming later are in my opinion presenting a major uh civilizational risk uh for probably the, the sheer ignorance in any of this and also the incapacity of understanding it when they're told right and so I make these videos also to provide with that minimum of backbone for anyone interested, given that it's free for everybody to watch fundamentally. Um, Alright, so for today I stop it here. I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it, otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. Uh, as always, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.